Hello, everyone, and welcome to the A Space, the volleyball podcast brought to you by CEV. Slight change of team sheets today. I've decided that we're going to go co presenter, then guest today, but very quickly. Matt Rogers, how are you? Good, Dave. Good. Yeah, great to be back. Great to be back. Great to have you back, and great to have you back as well for another episode. Thomas Rousseau, hello. Hi, happy to be here. Uh, happy to have you. Well, since the last time we spoke, anything fun to report? I hear you've got a new roommate. Yeah, yeah, we have a, a German roommate, a German flatmate, actually, uh, okay. who uh, yeah, a friend uh, that I met, actually, long story, in Egypt. Um, he's working in Brussels, uh, business school, Solvay Business School, and he was like, yeah, do you still have that extra room? Because I need room here. To f- he's like doing his internship at a Procter and Gamble, and I was like, of course. So yeah, we have a housemate here right now. Oh, nice. Yeah. So talk to me. Talk to me about languages because obviously you're you're Belgian, so you've got good English, good Flemish. How's your German? Uh, okay, okay, I'd say. Great. Okay, okay means fluent, Dave. Yeah, so, okay, I, I, I've learned that. Probably <laughs> not that fluent, but I'm trying to speak some German with him, you know. It's Could hard. you have a conversation in a bar and order a beer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that. in our mind, that's fluent, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any others to, uh, to talk about? Must have French. Uh, Italian. Italian, of course. Italian, because I played a year in, uh, in Italy, and uh, every player knows when you go to Italy, got to learn the language, beautiful language to learn. Um, and also they don't do any, uh, efforts to like speak English or something. So it was fun to learn uh, Italian. Uh, yeah. French is uh, also a language we speak here in, uh, in Belgium, in the South part of Belgium. And yeah, that's L- Luxembourgish. What they talk. That's where the CEV headquarters are based. For those that don't know, yeah, and, uh, yeah, quite quite close to Belgium. Mm. Yeah. Actually, so, we, we just drive to Luxembourg. I haven't even like you know when we're going on holidays. I haven't even like been in Luxembourg besides like a gas station. I was going to say that everyone goes to the gas stations because yeah. the tax is lower. So yeah, yeah. Cheap, cheap fuel, fuel oh, up and leave. Lu- oh exactly. yeah, leave Luxembourg full. That's the aim. Just before you go to France or something. Yeah. Yeah. How interesting. How interesting. I, I, I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed my visits to Luxembourg. But generally, it's because I've been going for volleyball purposes. <laughs> and everyone's really good company. I don't know what else there is to do. Uh, today, Thomas, we would love to talk to you about the Belgian national team and we've kind of got to know your route into to volleyball and and the the volleyball school and the fact that that gave you all the opportunities to turn pro but in fact let's start at at the volleyball school because when you what's what's the process there do you apply are you accepted do you have to be of a certain level or is it just for youngsters who are who are interested in volleyball in um in Flanders, so we are a crazy country. Even on a political level, we are a crazy country. There's Flanders and Wallonia, and then there's Brussels. And all these entities, and then there's the three different languages, which is a small part German, French, and Flemish. And all of these entities have their own parliament and their own uh, kind of like, uh, then we also have a federal government, you know, but everybody has to work together in this small country and it's really hard that's why we also don't have a government yet right now uh, because everybody's been taken into consideration and in volleyball we're already such a small country and there they divide flanders and wallonia even so in flanders you have the five provinces and there you play like you have some kind of tournaments of the best players of every province that play these tournaments and then there, there's kind of like trainers and cer- certain like scouts who pick out the talents and say, you can go for a tryout because you might be able to go to the volleyball school. So you do the tryouts and stuff, but you also need to do like a, a measurement, um, a prediction of your length. So you go to the hospital and they like take like some x-rays of your hand and then they kind of are able to predict how tall you're going to, because obviously you have to be tall to play volleyball. And then when they see, okay, this guy might be a good like receiver or opposite. um, And he's going to normally like grow to a certain length. Then they let you in. 
and then uh, you have the choice to if you want or not. You know, so it's kind of like a selection process, uh, which is quite interesting. And so that's only for the Flemish players. So, for example, even if there's good players in the south of Belgium, they rarely go to the volleyball school because a) they don't speak the language. And B, they don't really care that much about the south of Belgium because they have their own federation, volleyball federation. So these two volleyball federations are working together, which is completely nuts. Because our country is already so small, you know. So in the national team, for example, we have about two players from the south of Belgium, from Wallonia, and the rest is all from Flanders. So Can I start with the obvious question, Dave? <laughs> Please do. Are you on course or already reached your expected length? <laughs> uh, so I was supposed to be one meter ninety eight, and I'm one ninety nine. So oh, overachieving, it's even over. So it's great. Yeah, throw the science <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the second question: What is the youngest age that a volleyball school kind of starts for? It what? starts at the age of um, fifteen years old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it is quite quite developed by that. Yeah. That point. Uh, thank you so much for that insight by the way that was absolutely fascinating complicated but our our country is a little complicated when it comes to that so for those volleyball athletes in the south of belgium to to sort of reach the pinnacle and and wear the the belgian jersey it's very very difficult process yeah in my opinion it is and so my dad is from wallonia from the south of belgium my mom is from flanders um and for my dad as uh being a player from the south of Belgium, it was way harder, yeah, to get into a national team, uh, the national team of Belgium, and uh, yeah, he had to go to Flanders to like some club teams because most of the, I think like um, there's two teams in the south of Belgium and uh, on the highest level in the Liga A is the highest, and the rest is uh, from Flanders. So it's yeah, it's, I feel like it's kind of a disadvantage for them sometimes to. Uh, yeah, to develop and to get like better, faster, but uh, it's more like a political uh, thing, you know, which is a little stupid, in my opinion. Um, um, so you, yeah, you went there at fifteen, but I'm assuming you started playing way younger, right? Well, you must yeah. have been playing playing with a volleyball as a baby. Yeah, at the age of five, I started playing. That's like when you say playing there, you're meaning like peppering, volleying, no, digging, like or... growing, like signing up with a club team, you know, like uh, wow, yeah, that where you have. I, I think we had like two or maybe three practices uh, a week at that age, you know, and it's just yeah. like, yeah. And was it always then in your mind to be a, a red dragon? It was always like, did you feel like it was an inevitable or did you feel like it was a goal that, you know, maybe I, you'll I get there? A goal. It was a goal for sure. Yeah. It was a goal. I don't, I didn't think it was going to be, uh, it was going to happen for sure, but I wanted it really, really bad. So yeah. Then after a while, when you get older and you see like, Oh, I'm getting, better and i'm getting to practice with the national team already you know even if i wasn't part of it yet like that's getting closer closer and just yeah it's the whole like way or like road to the national team because it is still an honor it is always an honor you know uh, fortunately for in some countries it's a way bigger honor than in others for example i think if you are part in poland where i play uh for the club team if you are part of the national team in poland you made it in a sense like volleyball wise it's huge in belgium it's different because Belgi uh, volleyball is not as big as it is for example in poland but it is still an achievement you know that i am proud of and everybody should be proud of um so yeah Definitely. where would you say volleyball ranks in terms of the sports in belgium like yeah. the most popular and the, and the least popular yeah. um soccer eh? king soccer uh, king football uh, for sure is number you, one. You're saying king football, not like, not like king, king football. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it like, you know, it is, it is everywhere the same in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have, we actually have a really good field hockey team. They like became world champion, I think one or two years ago. So field hockey is really on the rise. Uh, and then cycling is huge in Belgium. Mm. Cycling is, uh, is really like, the sport of like the people uh i would say yeah and then obviously like you have basketball i think volleyball is a little little more popular than uh, basketball um and then it's a couple of like yeah sports where we have an individual who's good in you know this or that or um yeah 
But we, we've seen that popularity, Dave, obviously, because at Euro Volley and stuff like that, you're filling massive halls for volleyball. So Yeah, it yeah, got it's, it's, better. It got better for sure. Uh, with our national teams, with uh, the Red Dragons, with the Yellow Tigers, um, the results were getting better. And they also had just like a better, um, how to say, like strategy, I guess. Like they wanted to be more yeah. professional and they became more professional. Yeah. Yeah. You just saying about cycling there, there's a there's a young Belgian cyclist called Jules Hesters. I don't know if you ever come across him. Um, he taught me how to make a toasted sandwich in those hotel toasters, you know, those crazy <laughs> ones that go around. Honestly, he completely changed my life, did Jules <laughs> Hesters. Uh, but anyway. That's... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we digress. Um, you've said Red Dragons there, and no matter how hard I look, I can't figure it out. Why are the men's team called the Red Dragons and the women's team called the Yellow Tigers? Honestly, I have no idea. Oh, uh, no. I think... I think I have a clue, and um, it was we had one libero, uh, Stan de Jonker. Maybe you knew him. Um, he's not playing volleyball anymore, but um, he was. Uh, he has his own uh, freelance company now. Like he's uh, like making some kind of uh, productions with cameras and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, of course, he, yeah, yeah. And he um, he was like, yeah, we need to. You know, put ourselves out there. We need to use social media. We need to create more like a like kind of a brand in a sense, you know. So I think it was initially more him who who came up with the idea. Guys, we need to find like a name because we have the Red Devils, and you know we need to like you know have an uh, an identity. So I think that is like kind of where it started. But yeah, like the official meeting where we said we're gonna be the Red Dragons or something. I wasn't there. I don't remember anymore. Okay. Yeah, it probably started as a social media account and then got yeah. adopted as the, the yeah. name of the team. Yeah, probably. And have you been taught how to do dragon impersonations or anything? Oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we did one with the Lion King, we were getting lion lion roars, you know, yeah. the beach guy, Alessandro Smolin. So just wondered in your media training if you've been taught anything no, about no, dragons. No, no, no. How, how would you impersonate a dragon? <laughs> I'm sure I could ask my three-year-old and he'd tell me, but I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you're not gonna. I'm not gonna try even so. <laughs> no, it's it's, it's <laughs> oh, not something I'd want to do either. Don't worry. <laughs> oh wow. Um, but I'm sort of. We need to stop talking about the school eventually. But I'm just interested in your your kind of pathway. When you started at the school, was playing for the national team a sort of carrot that was dangled in front of you, as if to say, if you do well here then this is a possibility. And did everyone who started the school when you started think that it was something that they could achieve one day? I think so, because uh, in the youth categories, like you are youth, junior, and then you are senior, um, you're playing all these uh, European championships and world championships as well, you know? And I think 95% or 90% of the players uh, of those youth teams already were uh, players from the volleyball school so um, so I think like you know I'll have the biggest chance if I'm in volleyball school to get there but there's always exceptions there is always certain players um, like I said a couple from like the south of uh, Belgium like for example Francois Lecai is one Kevin Klinkenbeck um, who didn't do volleyball school but still they managed to get into the national team so but the chance is much bigger obviously and is there anyone that joined the volleyball school with you at the age of 15 and is still playing with you now in the national team? Is there anyone that's done that whole journey with you? Uh, yes. Um, for example, but he's one year younger than me. For example, I don't know Van der Velde, the middle blocker. Uh, but you know, I, I came like 15 years old and there was uh, Sandro who was uh, like two years older than me. There was Stan Dulles to our setter. Yale Ribbons, the Libero, Louis Stu was one year younger than me. Uh, all the guys actually who are in national team right now, basically all of them were also in volleyball school. Not maybe in my same class, but a uh, year younger, a year older. In my same class, there is one guy, Martin Colson, maybe you know him, uh, who's also a part of the national team now. Um, but yeah. So that's pretty cool. And it is like a, a generational thing, which hopefully yeah. just rolls over now. Generations that... Uh, 
actually the generations that are in volleyball uh, in the, the national team right now. Um, yeah, we kind of made it big in a sense. Those were like our, our golden generation so far, I'd say, with the best results so far. Uh, and now it's kind of we're in a transition zo- uh, and transition where, um, you know, we're, we need some young players to, to come. To, uh, to get better and to join our national team. You know, we need to, some players are getting a little older and older and, and you know, we need some young uh, talents now. So we're kind of, I feel like, a little bit in a tr- transition uh, zone as a national What's team. old to you, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> what is old to you? I mean, for, for old for a volleyball uh, player, eh, that you're already thinking, like, I'm close to, like... Uh, ending my career i guess like 33 or something okay. you start to think already like uh, we're, we're both over 33 yeah we'll, we'll stop there <laughs> that's it maybe maybe i'll never make it after <laughs> all <laughs> well let's talk about you getting into that national team then because you've been playing uh for a few years you'd won some national championships and am i correct in thinking 2015 was your first senior call up yeah, maybe. I don't remember, actually. I don't remember. Oh, you don't remember. Okay, so you don't, you don't remember the moment where you kind of got the call? I do remember, but I don't remember the year, the exact year. Okay, well, tell us about the experience then, finding out that you were going to be playing for the senior national team. Oh, well, team. so it was, um, it was actually pretty great because I still remember my first game with the national team. It was, we were playing the EuroLeague back then. And, um, and yeah, I... I went to Denmark with the team and I was, uh, I was 18 and, uh, we played our game. We won and I played, uh, yeah, a pretty amazing game. <laughs> I played, I, I think I scored like 10 out of 12 spikes or something, which is like really <laughs> like 80% or whatever. Like, so I played an incredible game. I was very stre- like very nervous and, uh, you know, playing with all these other guys, um, but still, I was like, wow, this is, can get better. Like your first game with the national team, uh, dreamed about this uh, for a long time. So it was actually a great first game. Uh, I, I still remember very well. And then had a couple of years. Uh, so that year, for example, there were some other things like European Championship where I just didn't make like the 12 or something. But then there was one year, and I think I was maybe 19 where um, I did the preparation for the European Championship in Bulgaria. And um, I was really good. I was really good during the whole preparation and uh, felt really good. And I didn't make the cut. So I was like, okay, uh, it's a coach's decision. Um, so I was preparing to go to my club team, which was Mons. I was going to Italy. Uh, so I packed all my stuff. I was ready to get into the car. And the coach changed his mind a couple of days after he said, you didn't make the team. So he called me and he said, uh, yes, Thomas, um, we would like you to come to the, to the European Championship with us. And I was like, yeah, I already told my club I'm going now and stuff. Uh, I'm about to like leave now. <laughs> and then, um, but then, okay, then I said, uh, fine, I'll do it. And I came back to the team a week before or like five days before the start of the tournament. And... I was practicing. I was still feeling well. And <laughs> we played the first game against Poland, and this coach started me. <laughs> and I, well, I went from, from like getting like not making the team to like starting six against Poland, the first uh, European Championship uh, game in in Bulgaria. There, so it was that was a crazy, crazy little uh, roller coaster, you know. But from then on, I guess I was like, yeah. Then I was like more starting six, and yeah. What a European there. Championship debut, Poland. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Did that feel like it was a bigger game than anything you'd experienced so far in your career? Oh, I was, I was really nervous, yeah. Mm. I, uh, we played against uh, Poland, first yeah. game, Kurek uh, and stuff. I, w- I always looked up to Kurek. Like, he was like my idol uh, when I was younger. And I blocked him like two, twice, I think, or something, and like really hard. So I was like, <laughs> as a young man, like, yeah, so uh, so excited and a little like, because it's not just you can play maybe like lower teams in the European Championship as well, but it was Poland, you know, the mm. first game, and it was Poland. So very nervous. We didn't win, but uh, still, I hit pretty well, and I was like, okay, I get this chance. Like I don't have anything to lose, and I'll just uh, give it my all and see. So. 
Um, Thomas, I found your first ever match just while you were talking through that. Your memory is incredible. It was 10 out of 12 spikes. Yeah. No way. Can, <laughs> you, can, you, can you remember who you were playing? Denmark, I think. Yeah, it was Denmark. Denmark. Yeah, yeah. Denmark in 2013. Yeah. June and 2013. And they were doing this special, uh, they were trying this new thing out where the sets were only till 21. They were until 25. It was. Oh, so you cool. would have got way more. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So from that moment, yeah, you're in the team. I can see it. Goodness yeah. me. 2013. Was, uh, Those are 2013. So. That, that was your first major competition then. You played in the EuroLeague and in 2015, so you lost that game to Poland, but then you beat Slovenia, you beat Belarus, you get out of the group, then eventually you lost to Germany in the playoffs. What did that feel like from a personal perspective and from a team perspective? Was that kind of what you expected or did you think you could have gone a little further? Uh, wait, you're talking about this one in Bulgaria? or what Yeah, yeah. So that was 2015, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, Germany, we know Germany pretty well also, and they were, they had Vital uh, Heinen as a coach, mm. who is a uh, Belgian, and they had a really good team, um, but for us, it was more like, you know, we, we need to build momentum, and mm -hmm. when uh, we don't have the biggest talents in uh, Europe, we don't have the biggest players, but we do know when we are able to play really well together and have this like kind of call it like a belgian fire let's say <laughs> where we're all together uh, as as like really like a group of friends because like i said because of this volleyball school and everything that we had together all those guys on the team we all know each other so well so if we have this momentum we can win against those like really top teams but everything needs to be right we need we all need to be like on the, like uh, tips of our toes um and we already had a lot of like situations where it felt like that we could have done more and we weren't able to finish it off or something against those kind of teams and then you know if you can do that against those kind of teams you'll never win against the best teams in the world and back then germany was one of the better teams in the in the world i think so mm. fast forward two years is that what happened in 2017 and everything clicked because your run in euro volley 2017 was impressive we were we we were fourth yeah it's yeah. better to say you were semi-finalists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and then ended up fourth. But yeah. yeah, ended up fourth. Yeah, uh, and we lost against the winner. Uh, yeah. Exactly. We won and we lost against Russia. That was yeah. for me. That was I think our best uh, tournament so far. We, it was with Vital again, with Vital Hannon, and um, yeah, we our first game was against France, and we won three two against France, who was the team at the moment as well. You know, in Capet, and they had everything and we we beat them 3-2 and it was our first game we were like what <laughs> and your and your neighbors they're your neighbors yeah 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 and from that like after that game we kind of like you know really started to believe in ourselves and we just we beat italy i think 3-1 or 3-0 i think it was 3-0 yeah we, we we beat a couple of teams that were really good teams you know and yeah and then in the end we played against russia and russia was too strong that's yeah, we, we, we had to admit that. And then we had this, this cursed game for this bronze medal, you know, where it always, there was a 3-2 against Serbia and Serbia, they never give up. And it was a back and forth. And in the end, yeah, we, we didn't, we weren't able to, or we didn't have the experience or we were, I don't know, we, did, we were not able to win that game, unfortunately. So with that tournament then, um, did that feel like an overachievement? Did it feel like an opportunity missed because you didn't come away with a medal? Or again, did it just sort of reach the expectations that you had as a group? I think obviously you want the medal, so disappointed about that for sure. Um, but I felt like it was kind of um, a reward for, we felt like we were able to do that and we deserved it in a sense because we had been performing multiple summers pretty well and we had been showing like we we're ready to compete against these uh top top teams you know uh so for us it was more like the confirmation and the reward we got for our hard work to show we can be uh not maybe not any uh, anybody in the world but like we're really like uh ready for this you know for the top and then unfortunately uh we were in world league as well after we won this european league and stuff and then we got uh 
degraded, I guess, uh, and we are playing European League, and that was kind of a se uh, step back for us as well, unfortunately. And that was out of our hands, so that was uh, mm. obviously not that nice after the good uh, performances, you know, of our team. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's. I can understand certainly in your situation and the some other countries as well that yeah, it's not been as how can I say not been as easy or smooth as you would have liked with the the World League transition into VNL. Yeah, yeah, because the World League really um, like catapulted our, us like in a in the most positive way. Like it it was such a huge learning school. We were playing all these different teams, like different styles. You play Iran, you play Argentina, you play those kind of like countries as well. You play Asian countries uh, when we are mostly used to European volleyball, you know. So for us, it was a great learning school, and we were just really learning to win against those teams in that World League as well. Um, so that was definitely like world league was, is, is if, if you can play it as a player, it's huge. Like, you know, you can never underestimate the importance of world league. Now it's called, um, what is it like? Uh, VNL. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, well, st sticking with Euro Valley 2017, you were obviously with Vital Heinen then. Um, he's one of my favorite coaches because I obviously watch quite a bit of volleyball and I wouldn't say it becomes boring or repetitive, but I generally end up focusing on, on the smaller aspects of the sport. And I just sometimes watch him for whole rallies. It's fan fascinating. <laughs> How was it to be coached oh. by him? <laughs> oh, he's a, uh, yeah, he's definitely a personality. He's definitely an entertainer. I worked with him in uh, Friedrichshaven. So after my year yeah, in true. Italy, um, he said, Thomas, I'm going to be the coach of the national team. I'd like to work with you for a whole year. And I was like, sure. Um, great coach, uh, great uh, trainer. So worked with him a whole year, had a lot of experiences. And the thing is, um, I was struggling a lot that year, like being kind of frustrated and, and stuff, because he always puts the finger on the wound, always makes you say, Every day he tells you, Thomas, this is not like you're not doing this good enough. You're not doing this good. So he really pushes you a lot, and you get really frustrated sometimes. Like kind of, a, oh, this guy, you know, it's an annoying guy. And um, but I learned the most out of that season with him. Um, so I really respected him in that sense, where you know you can see that this guy is maybe not always nice to you, but he is making you so much better, you know, uh, in his own way because he has his own personality and it's also, you know, like he is uh, during the games, he gets competitive. He's uh, kind of an entertainer and he's a, he, he's, a, he's a whole character, you know, it's difficult to explain. Um, but as a coach, as a trainer, he, uh, he taught me so much. So I, I really liked our first summer together with the national team um, when he was telling us like, you guys are just shit in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> basically, sorry for my language, but basically uh, every day he was telling us like, you know, you need to be better, you need to do this better than that. And then we qualified for the world championship with him, first summer with him. We, we had this result in Poland on the European championship. We had a great world league. Um, and that was all in one summer with him. While you know that everybody, every player knows working with Vital, you need some time to kind of understand how his way, how he works, and do you need to be able to like get on that train? But it, it takes you some time. In the beginning, you'll be a little shocked. So we were like, one summer is great already, like pretty good results after one summer. Um, and then, yeah, unfortunately, he signed with Poland, um, which obviously in Belgium, they we were kind of upset about. But uh, on a personal level, you kind of also understand he's super ambitious, and he had the, the possibility and he became world, world champion with Poland so he made the right decision for his career as a, as a coach and oh, is yeah. he is he exactly the same um you know, let's say behind the camera or off the camera like because when we do interviews with him or when he do any features yeah. or, or when the when the game's happening everyone has this image of Vito Heinen is he the same in training does, does nothing change I, really? I think he is I, uh, everybody that also knows him you know knows that he has a lot of energy and he talks a lot um, but it's kind of the same in practice, uh, more, but more that like he, he gets pissed off when, you know, when he needs to, and he, he makes it really clear to the team, like, I'm not satisfied and everybody like, okay, if Vital's not satisfied, like that's, that's not good. <laughs> like, you know, so I would right. say like, he's definitely not like a different person, uh, 
off and uh, on the camera. And his job is to get Definitely to really better players. So and, yeah, and he, and he yeah. achieved that. So yeah. yeah, just different methods. I've yeah. always wanted to have a debate between him and um, Giovanni Gudetti. I'd love to get those two on a topic they're both really passionate about. Yeah. I think that'd be fascinating yeah. to see those two debate it out. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah we'll, we'll see. Um, whilst we're on Eurovolley 2017, where you, you lost to Russia, I thought now would be a good time, Dave, to do the mystery man. Ah, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, where, where are we up to with it, Matt? Well... It's been a few more clues released since Thomas last last heard about it. So just to make sure everyone is up to date, we are now reaching the last one. So today is the big reveal. Okay. We've had 16 clues until now. I'm going to try and go through them rapid fire. Well, while you just before you go through them, just uh, just a reminder that in a previous episode, Thomas first guessed Svetan Sokolov. And I could okay. neither confirm nor deny. Thomas, do you, you think couldn't. that's the do you think that's the correct answer? Uh, no. Okay. No, I, have a, I have a different candidate. All right. Let's uh, let's give you some more clues then. Well, judging by the clues that have come out now, I'm hoping you get this right, uh, Thomas. So I'm going to go through them in the order that they've gone out. So it's a volleyball player, won the Champions League. Shoe size is 14. Must that must be normal in volleyball, though, right? 14. <laughs> Um, right-handed, won the European Championships, um, best known for his spiking, only played for two clubs, that's quite rare, born in 1988, so I, that's old, right, Thomas? Old, <laughs> old man, surprised he doesn't need a walking <laughs> stick or a wheelchair. <laughs> um, where are we, sorry, uh, never won the World Championships, volleyball idol is Sergei Chichukin. Um was born in March, two metres, three centimetres tall, has won Olympic gold, that's a big clue, isn't it? Um, Country he is from Russia, so we know he's Russian. We know he's the opposite hitter, and we know he wears shirt number seventeen. So Thomas, I'm hoping now you've got this. Seventeen, I would say Maxim Mikhailov. If it's not Maxim Mikhailov, then we're all completely fooled, aren't we? Because <laughs> a Russian opposite hitter with a shirt number of seventeen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's just double check. I feel like this is the last ball out of the bag, you know, when you have to just double check that we're all on on course. Mystery man. Who are you? I'm Maxim Mikhailov. So there he we gets have it. it. Well we guessed, it. Thomas. Yes. Because that I would have been embarrassing it. if you hadn't got that. Yeah. But at least <laughs> I was like, uh, Muzerski maybe, because he's also from 88. Oh, and is he? Uh, okay, he's a middle blocker, but he also played as an opposite when they won like a true. gold medal in uh, on in the Olympic side, so like Mizerski maybe. But then the shoe, uh, shoe size fourteen was like Ooh, maybe he has a <laughs> <laughs> maybe he's a sixteen. I don't know. I don't know what his shoe size is. But yeah, Maxim Mihailov. Nice. While we're on the topic of Mikhailov, you've played against him a couple of times. What's he like to face? Oh, he's a. Uh... He's the most difficult guy to block by far. Oh, yeah. Really? I had a couple of, op- you kind of remember like the opposites. You can block or you can, or you're having a lot of difficulties with. This guy, I was always struggling with so much like blocking him. Uh, he's just, I think, like a perfect example. Like he's so modest. He won so many things already, so many individual awards, even and stuff. And this guy is so modest. And you can see him even in practices. Like before the games or something, we see them practice and stretch and this and that. This guy is like so professional, so modest, and he's one of the best in the world, you know? So that's you. And then I also met him like off the court, just like um, kind of after after um, the game, like in a restaurant. And he's just like a very, yeah, again, same, like the same person, super modest, super polite. Uh even if he could have maybe like other other people in his situation would be like, yeah, I'm the star here of the... No, he's not like that. So I like him a lot. Well, we're obviously leading up to an interview with him. So we, we yeah. talked to him a while back now, actually, wasn't it, Dave? It was, um, it was. And that will go out prior to the Champions League season. And nice. a few things with him. And one of them was we asked him to, to think back over the Champions League season one. And I don't think it's unfair to say, Dave, he, he struggled to separate them because there are yeah. so many. He, he couldn't really, he was like, was that 14 or 15? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, my God. Yeah. i tell you what else I really like as well, because oh. translation's amazing. But the way in his accent, he calls it League of Champions. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
but but also you talking about all the things that he's achieved thomas i think the fact that he's won so many champions league mvps being in the same team as leon tells you everything you need to know about his quality on the court what what makes him so hard to block just out of interest yeah i mean for me mostly he's so hard to read first of all he's so high you know so you need to already like really try to jump as high as you can every single time you know you're not that's not the kind of player where you say just like straight hands good like positioning timing you need to get to his height first of all you know once you're there like you can't read him in my opinion like, he's so straight he's so like always the same and he has all these hits that are super long in the court but like from the same position so i'm like ah this guy is like going line and then he can always go diagonal anyways and then sometimes like i can never read him you know and he can always see me like so you i, I was like Maybe I was too early or something, but I was like, this guy I've never <laughs> blocked before, you know? And I love blocking opposites, and opposites spike really hard, so you can block them, and it's a really good feeling, you know? But with him, it was, it was really hard, yeah. Yeah, and I said to Dave, actually, before we recorded this, I, he, for me, he's just robotic. Like, it, everything always looks like it's copy-paste, and that, that him, shows when you've mastered it, doesn't it? Yeah. They call him uh, Machine Gun Mikhailov, I think, yeah? Oh, I've, yeah, I've heard that, yeah. Uh, Maxim, uh, machine, something with machine that like, is so like automatic, you know. Well, whenever you play him from now on, you know I will be watching for you to try and block him. <laughs> and if you do, I will celebrate with He's you. That's for sure. And thinking and <laughs> oh, I'm block this guy. <laughs> do you have? Do you have any sort of individual moments? You, in fact, you spoke about it on your debut where you made a block against a player that you really admired. But you know, in a in a volleyball match, there are a hundred and fifty. 200 sometimes more points required to get to the end of the game yeah. are there any blocks that you make or, or winning hits that you make yeah. that really stand out in your mind yeah i guess mostly the clutch moments you know mostly when you're able to finish a match or something mm-hmm. those are pretty pretty epic like those you you remember definitely when it was like a 3-2 or something or a very close game those you remember um individual actions you know maybe sometimes like a huge blocker here or there because like in spike you can have like you spike more than you block you know um and for example i was playing uh, in this european championship we were playing the netherlands against nimir abdelaziz and this guy was so so nice to block you know because he spikes so hard <laughs> so the feeling is just so wonderful when he spikes in your arms um, yeah, but he was just starting as an opposite back then, and now, like a couple of years later, uh, I played again. Like we played practice game against him again, and I had no chance. <laughs> <And I> was, <laughs> this guy is a yeah, serious, serious opposite. Uh, Talk, talking to those crunch moments when you're playing a game of volleyball, do you follow the score? And I know it's a silly question, but like every point, do you check in? Okay, yeah, now it's fifteen, now it's seventeen, or are you more like play and every now and again check the score? I mean, it's more, I think when it's close for sure. Uh, but once you start like, you know, being down a couple of points, then you stop looking for sure. Because then you're like, we got to find our, t- like, we got to find our game now. And you, you can't like look at the scoreboard right now because you're four or five points down, you know, when you're ahead four or five points, you're kind of like following, but not as serious as well. But uh, yeah, when it's close, obviously like you follow it for sure. Because, I mean, I, I was a low-level player, but I did this fascinating thing with a coach once where we played a game and we couldn't see the score. And it was literally like, oh, you've won or you've <laughs> lost. And what, what it proved to us was that we were playing differently in the 20s yeah. compared to the start because we yeah. knew it was the 20s. Oh, yeah. I can so, yeah. imagine. Yeah, I can imagine for sure. But that's also why it's not nice, in my opinion, when you, in practice, play a game six against six and there's no score because you're so much more free and you try so much more stuff and there's no, there's basically yeah. no pressure. You know? mm. And uh, yeah, you need pressure because in the, in the games, you know, and then there's fans and then there's everything Then you need to be ready for those moments. Yeah. Especially when you're playing for, uh, especially when you're playing for the national team, because every game matters really, doesn't it? The, the majority of the time you're playing, in a competitive fixture it's not like for your for your club where there's a league and if you lose a few games it's frustrating but it's not the be all and end all every time every time you pull on the the belgium jersey it's it seems like a must-win game yeah true but in a sense there's also more 
I would say more uh, pressure in the club team sometimes because you know, for example, you lost two in a row mm. and there's pressure on the team from even like the club out or something, you know, and then there's extra pressure. So this can also be, and in the national team, you know, every same game is important, but the federation um, is pretty laid back in a sense, like where you do the sportive and we take care of the rest, you know? Okay. So semi-finalists in 2017, finishing fourth in brackets. Um, let's move on to 2019. That must have been different playing in Belgium. And obviously the format yeah. changed. You had more, yes. more, more games in the pool. How, how was 2019 looking back now? Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. Our group phase was very, very good. Like, first of all, in our own country. So uh, that was a unique experience. And yeah, we won uh, all our games in the group phase besides the one against Serbia. And Serbia won the tournament. So basically, if you win against Belgium, you, <laughs> yeah. you get the medal. Get the gold medal, yeah. <laughs> Serbia won it. Uh, so our group phase was great. And then we played Ukraine in, um, I don't know how you call it, like the eight finals? Like, like yeah, finals. first round of the playoffs. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah for, uh, and we played Ukraine. Um, and Ukraine had a really good team with some really good players and honestly, like kind of underestimated them in a sense because we lost that game 3-2 or also our opposite. Um, to the, the practice before the game, landed and he had something in his back he couldn't play uh so the, the team was like mixed up a little and yeah we lost so that was that was devastating that was really like yeah it's just over we were like wow the tournament is over so great group phase but we weren't able to you know to do it when it mattered and quarterfinals was kind of our goal like because mm -hmm. there for like quarterfinals and then we see where we where we end up you know um yeah, and you got yourself in a position to to win that game as well, hadn't you? Because you lost the first set, then in sets two and three, you won them yeah. quite comfortably by I think it was seven points both times. Yeah, yeah, it was it was one of those games that was super, um, you know, where emotions were high and and you know, like we were we were also a little bit like, what is happening? You know, mm. we are like we we have to win this game, like Ukraine. We need to like uh, we need to win this this game and move on to the quarterfinals. But yeah, you can't think like this, that you got to think every game at a time, you know, which, which we didn't. And also like Ukraine played very well. Like that's also something we shouldn't like forget, you know, because in Belgium, obviously people were disappointed. Um, and I was too, but at the same time, Ukraine was also a pretty good team. It's not because they were Ukraine and not like uh, Italy or something that they didn't play really well as well. Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that they went five sets with Serbia the next round as well. I mean, they were a, they were a pretty serious, yeah. pretty serious yeah. team. No, kind of underdog of the, of the whole competition. Hmm. How, how is it different when you play at home? I mean, I'm assuming that if you had a choice, you'd always play at home rather than away. But that does bring added pressure, doesn't it? Because there's sometimes expectation. And our mystery man, now Maxim Mihailov, everyone knows, he was talking about playing in Kazan. There's like an expectation. And when they won that Champions League in Kazan, yeah. it was kind of like a we're just waiting for it to happen feeling from the crowd. Yeah. And that brings pressure, doesn't it? That, yeah. that must change mentality. On a different level, we, I think we had that against Ukraine, you know. And, yeah. um, and in the group phase, it was uh, Germany was the team to beat for us because we were like, or Serbia or Germany, but Serbia was in this momentum and you could see, okay, Serbia is really high level, like playing high level volleyball. So we were like, we won Germany. That was great. Spain, uh, the rest, Austria and stuff, uh, Slovakia. Um, but then, yeah, then, then it was pressure for, for sure because then we're like, oh, Belgium is really good. This is their chance in, own, uh, you know, in their own country. They, they might like, be able to get further in the competition. And then, yeah, then uh, you, you kind of are the favorite against Ukraine and we are not very used to being the favorite. So maybe you know, we weren't able to uh, manage the stress uh, good enough. Hmm. What about future ambitions then? So... You said there you had like expectations within tournaments. So quarterfinals was 2019. That was the kind of target or expectation. Yeah. Looking at the bigger picture, what, what's the ambition for, for Thomas? Well, like I, I already said before, I think we're kind of, um, in my opinion, and I think we have to say the things as they are, we're kind of in a transition uh, moment in our national team. 
where we had a couple of uh, coaches and they didn't stick around. It all stayed. Then it was Anastasi, then it was Van Kerkhove, and now we have a new coach, Fernando Munoz, Spanish coach, and we want to build something, but on the long term, we can't like just have a coach for one year. You know, we need to develop something and we need to have a goal. And right now our goal is very clear as Belgians. In volleyball, we haven't been to the Olympic Games, so we'll really try to work to get to the Olympic Games in Paris in 2024. But that's going to be like some decisions are going to have to be made, you know, players wise and also like structure wise. Like we need to develop something with one coach and we need to have like younger players also um, coming to have new influences in our team. Because like I said, this team was already together for a very long time. So for us, it's kind of, um, yeah, Corona now, we're going to practice a little bit and then we're going to go to our team, our club teams. But uh, it's going to be important and crucial uh, summers for us, the next summers, to try and develop something, uh, something new. Because now we've been going on on this like good um, results and like, okay, we're on the map now, but what now? You know, now we're, we're at a turning point that we have to think about and see how that develops. Fernando's great. I mean, yeah. I, I judge coaches on how they interact with media. That's that's my <laughs> own scale. And on that scale, he's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I haven't you're... met him, so we'll see how it goes. But... Ah, good. Does the Olympics seem like a realistic goal, though? Because if I if I look at the trajectory, well, even as since you've been a part of the national team, you're back qualifying for world championships now when you hadn't done it for decades before. Yeah, you're yeah. getting through the group phases of the European championships and showing like you can push in yeah. to, to the latter stages. And, and as you said before, be any team if you play well, if you play your game. So Europe is, I don't think anyone would dispute the most difficult continent to qualify yeah, for yeah. an Olympic Games out of. So, you know, honestly, in your heart of hearts, is it a possibility? And is that the kind of success level that you will hang your hat on as a, as a pro now? Yeah. Is the Olympics the main thing that you really want to get well, out think, of pro volleyball? I think for European uh, teams to, to get to the Olympics is so much harder. And in a sense, um, it's a little unfair in the sense that, like, if we would be there in the Olympic Games, I'm sure we would be able to beat teams uh, uh, different teams that are there from other continents. So I know like for Europe, there's limited uh, places, but I think also maybe they are going to like, they, they are seeing this in volleyball. Okay, this is the case. Europe has a lot of really good countries and some that deserve to be there. Uh, it's up to us to like prove that we deserve to be there, of course. But I think maybe there might be some change in the way they do it, you know? And I think that would be necessary, honestly, to have a realistic image of how volleyball is uh, on, a, on a global level, you know. Um, is it realistic? I mean, a couple of years ago, world championships and stuff were not even realistic for a Belgian national team. And we've already made it pretty far. So I think it is important for us to set a goal and also, like, you know, to believe in it. And then you never know what happens. I know what I you would... want to ask him, Matt. I'm... Uh, just ask him. Well, uh, well, I don't. Well, I wasn't going to ask what I think you think I'm going to ask. Okay. But anyway, I'm going to go with what I was going to ask, and then I'm going to guess what you think I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> for, for me, I think it's absolutely realistic because the teams that have qualified for Tokyo, you have beaten from Europe. Mm. So even if you just take the current pathway, I think that all that needs to happen is you've got to have that tournament where everything clicks. Yeah. At the moment when it most matters for the Olympics. And if that happens, absolutely it's possible. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. True. Correct. Yeah. We played against the States uh in the first round like last summer I I think. And the States, yeah, they were they were we played good, but the States were too strong for us, you know, and then it was uh already over basically and then we had to go to the second round and there we played all these uh great teams where eventually France uh you know was able to qualify. Mm. And, yeah, that, that makes it definitely hard as second round. You have to have a little bit of luck in that first round, maybe, with what teams you have in your group. Uh, but second round, for sure, for European teams, like the teams that are there are really good, you know. That was such a weird tournament, though, in January, where France lost the two games in the group stages and then yeah. just arrived yeah. in time for the final yeah. against Germany. It was, yeah, that was pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Dave, I think that you were expecting me to ask about beach. Is that? I was, yeah. Were you? I, okay. I thought I thought you were gonna. <laughs> I thought you were revving up to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is quite simple: that potentially, if it doesn't work out in twenty four, there is a, an easier route to get to the Olympics, and I only mean that in the sense of qualifications. There's more teams. There's less players required to be of the Olympic level. Is beach something you've ever thought about? From a from a like a career point of view, I mean, uh, let's say sport wise, for sure. I love the sport; it's great. Like uh, I think I would be also pretty good at it. Um, but the thing is, in Belgium, it's hard. We have one duo, and they're pretty decent. And they were really close to going to the Olympic Games, uh, qualifying for the Olympic Games. But uh, there's no there's no funding in Belgium for beach volleyball. We're not a beach volleyball country, which is unfortunate. So it's it's hard. But that duo is kind of setting a path for like hopefully like uh, younger players and stuff. So I honestly like say I might consider it. I wouldn't give up my volleyball career for it right now, for sure not. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a great sport. And like you said, like if you have the chance to go to the Olympics, uh, it's still like kind of, it has similarities with uh, indoor volleyball, you know. So I, I definitely like consider it, but not right now. And also, like I said, in Belgium, it has to get a little better when it comes to like the professionalism and the funding and all that around beach volleyball. Yeah, the man's got to eat. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny, Dave, isn't it? Because yeah. you asked a similar thing to Sam Duro, and he said a very similar answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can see I it. Must we, be... would, we would consider like playing together. Maybe who knows? <laughs> it'd be, it'd be well, a good team. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to see it. You must do it for a bit of fun, though. Sometimes as, with Sam and other players on the national yeah, team. Yeah, right now we're actually with an, with a couple of guys from the national team. We are uh, and the assistant coach of the national team. We have some beach practices. Because the official program only starts next week, Monday. Uh, and we were anxious to like start, you know, playing again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we were just like outdoor as possible with like a few guys. So we're just uh, practicing like two, three times a week in the, in the sand. Just also prepares you really well for uh, indoor. So yeah. how's, your, how's your jumping been? Can you still get up? <laughs> it's actually pretty okay. I was, uh, I was expecting worse. So... <laughs> I'm hopeful. And there's also obviously snow volleyball. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Within the next four to eight years, there's there's talk of snow volleyball being in the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, I know. I Can you was, imagine I, the mass migration of players who are going to think, I'm going to get to oh, the wow. Winter Olympics? Yeah. Just... That's actually a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's, a, it's a great sport. Do you, do you ski? Uh, yeah, before my career, I mean, before my volleyball career, I used to, yeah. But like yeah. during volleyball, you can't do it. And it's one of yeah. the biggest things I miss actually, or hate giving up because of volleyball. But that's, yeah. a, that's a good point, snow volleyball. But I think it needs some time still to like get, like develop a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we're talking like six years, I think, here minimum. But potentially, if you see out the next Olympic cycle. Yeah. I mean, you know, I play in Poland. I'm used to the cold now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, amazing. Oh. Shall we attempt my perfect player, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, Thomas, if you had some time to think about this. Well, this I'm, the, I'm not the entirely feature. I'm not entirely has it been explained? Tell me with the perfect player. Yeah. Explain. So, it's quite simple really. You have to build the ultimate volleyball player and you can take characteristics from different players that you've played with or against. Yeah. So, cool. you could say for example, I don't know, uh, jump, you want Dami Makari. It could be that you say um, spike, you want Maxim Mihailov. It yeah. could be that you say block, you want Svetlana Sokolov, whatever it is. Um, and it can be physical things like those, or it could be like the competitive, the fighting yeah. side of things, the focus, the drive, whatever it is you want to be. So just some characteristics that you think are important for a volleyball player, and then who you would take that characteristic from. Okay, so I think I would base it on in general on Juan Torena um, but uh, but like with different uh, attributes from different players but I think he is uh, the most complete volleyball player okay. uh, and definitely in my position um, but I would take this, the ball handling skills of uh, Kubiak uh, 
amazing, amazing technical abilities in every aspect of the game, reception-wise, uh, spiking. So I would take uh, his ball handling skills. I would take Leon, uh, Leon's hammer, you know, his, uh, his arm. <laughs> Uh, he has crazy long arms and he spikes so strong uh, and obviously jumps really well. But I'm, I wouldn't want to, for example, jump like too high, to be honest. Like Quantorena or Leon or something is fine, but they're not like those guys that are like extreme, you know, because mostly the guys who jump too high are sometimes too high, even in block and stuff. Like it's easier to, to score on them and stuff. So I would have like a good jump, but not like exaggerated. Um, but then I would, uh, I was thinking about the serve. I would take maybe Anderson's serve, maybe. I would uh, maybe, uh, maybe take Leon's serve. Yeah. What about yeah. more of like the, the mental side of things then? The mental side of things, I would say I would take my, uh, my personality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, so it's the one you know best. <laughs> you always have to respect yourself as a player and you always have yeah. to somewhere believe that you can be the best at something. Um, and I would take my, uh, my personality on the court uh, in the sense of um, I, know I, uh, I know that I have something I can give to my teammates that everybody appreciates playing with me in a sense where I can bring a lot of energy in a team uh, in a positive way. But, I mean, that's maybe one of my... Uh, best traits to to have that you know like that uh, mental aspect so i would take that for me um i can see that i can see that and for a bit of fun whose hair would you take for this perfect play because you've had a few different hairstyles oh yeah now i'm growing my hair long again, so. <laughs> i made the mistake of cutting it and before i had long hair and i felt so much better with the long hair so but i was making net, net mistakes uh touching the net with my hair uh, <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah i we always you should have just had a ponytail and, and like clipped it into the back uh, of your yeah, head. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And there was this thing in Poland, there were uh, two times, like they said, net mistake, and they could see it on, uh, on TV that it was the hair touching the net. But the rules say that the hair can touch the net. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, because uh, in girls' net. volleyball, it's, it's fine to touch the net. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I tweeted, and like, uh, plus Liga, hey, come on, you need to know your rules. And, uh, <laughs> and I got some comments from uh, Polish ex-players like uh, Ignac Zaka and stuff like and they're like or maybe you should just cut your hair you know and like, <laughs> oh, yeah this is a <laughs> but now it's going long again hate yeah. is gone hate as they say yeah, yeah. but yeah. the perfect player yeah I mean I think it's super interesting we uh with my teammates from last year made like our perfect ideal starting six and stuff and it it's hours of discussing um but definitely like think Two of the best players right now are, are Juan Torrena and Leon on the receiving end. Uh, Leon is, um, Juan Torrena is already getting a little older and still he is still doing it. You know, he's jumping lower than he was before and he's still doing it and proving it every single time. So that's huge. Yeah. No massive how many, how yeah. many kilometers of tape throughout his career do you think Juan Torrena has had on his fingers? <laughs> <laughs> We have those players. It's like you really Atanasievich is the same, and they, I also wonder like, what is what is wrong? Like, how much time does that take? Like, yeah. I don't have time before a practice like to to tape my fingers that much. I wonder if they have a tape sponsor. That'd be quite funny, wouldn't it? I mean, I hope for them they do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they must uh, do. Must there's not much space for any advertising or anything, is there? It's not like you could have the, yeah, the brand going. Be- Oh, that's a business uh, idea. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start it. I'm gonna start my volleyball <laughs> tape. Tape. Yeah. There's a market for that. Yeah, and it's four, four letters. Tape. You could just that could be the brand. Yeah, that tape. could be on your knuckles. <laughs> like when bikers used to have love and hate tattooed on their knuckles, you could just tape. have it across there. Uh, right then, this is getting silly, and I think it would be a good point to draw this to a close. Um, Thomas, it's been so great to chat to you about the national team today and about everything we've spoken about it's during these episodes. If you, could, if you could sort of have an ambition, hopefully you've got 10 years left as a, as a professional volleyball player, yeah. but in terms of your achievements as a Red Dragon, as a Belgian international, what would mean success for you when you decide to call it a day? I mean, I, I got to say Olympics because... Uh... 
it's the thing I think every athlete wants and I've been dreaming about that for the longest time. So I really want to do whatever it takes to maybe one day get to the Olympics. Yeah. And what, what better way to do it than to qualify for, for Paris? I mean, that would be just down the road. That's kind of our, uh, it's, that is our uh, main subject. It's like road to Paris 2024. Yeah. We start already this summer. So I like that, you know, you yeah. have a clear goal and, you know, everybody has to be able to sacrifice whatever is necessary to, to at least try, you know. Well, we will be following with interest, that's yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, Can't wait to that. see how it unfolds. Thank you. This has been absolutely lovely episodes. It's been great to get to know you. Uh, Matt Rogers, anything to report from HQ? Uh, not a lot. Just excited to start looking into next season, really. Um, so, yeah, next week's podcast will be um, all about next season, the upcoming season. And we've got, obviously, Mystery Man now revealed, Maxim Mahailov. He'll do a feature. And we've also got Gabby, who's going to be talking around her first year in Back of Bank and plans for the future. There is not a volleyball podcast that gets the big names that we do. Still doing episodes on Mondays and Friday, Monday for the A Space, Friday to join myself, Matt and Key with the unscripted or the debate. And we're actually doing the videos on a Wednesday now. So it's a good job you've done your hair, Thomas. Um, <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much for listening as always please like subscribe tell your friends keep spreading the good word because we really do enjoy bringing the a space podcast to you but most importantly join us for the next episode bye 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 guys